Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN AM for Thursday, February 24th, 2022. And our top story today, what is a non-qualified mortgage? Joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Carl Delmont is the Chief Executive Officer of Friedmont Mortgage Corporation. Carl, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Oh, great seeing you. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, it's, and we're going to talk about non-qualified mortgages. But before we get into that, what's the update on the housing market? Is it still as tight as it has been, or is it even tighter now? Yeah, I think it's probably tighter now simply because inventory hasn't improved. And with rates rising, it's actually the affordability has made it a little bit more challenging for some and on top of that, just some people are just a little bit discouraged. They feel like they've missed out. But I think it's important, and we've said this the last time we were on, to, to frame this within historical measures, right? When you're looking at 30-year fixed mortgage rates, we are still so far below historical norms, and we're really not that far off all-time low. So it's still affordable. It's just when you compare it, it is a little bit more money now. My feeling, though, is you know when you look at the Fed, you know it's, the Fed's going to raise rates in March. You know, how much? Quarter, 50 basis points. A lot of people are saying that would be 50 basis points. But um, in 2015 and 2017, the last two times the Fed raised rates, mortgage rates actually improved right after they announced a rate hike. And I think it's because the markets and investors got ahead of the game and then they realized, okay, now we know where we are, let's readjust. So let's see if that holds true again. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I guess all bets are off. We're gonna have to see what the actually net result is. We can, we can do what we can about predicting and thinking, right? But we have to see actually how it all plays out. Last question before we get in NQMs here, non-qual mortgages. Uh, you know, is it your sense that, um, you know, how do you, how do you get past the discouragement? The discouragement, if you're a first time buyer, there's a lack, you wanna buy that house, you've saved money for a down payment. Now, whether that's 10%, 50%, 20%, 100%, uh, but, but you just can't get your foot in the door. Is, is that a long-term trend, do you think, or do you think that discouragement can go away um, over the next six to 12 months? I think when people look at where rents are going, that's, that's probably a catalyst for people to, to start getting encouraged again, even if they are disencouraged. But um, I think you know when you're looking at the combination of rates are moving up, uh, the fact that there's not much inventory and people are, you know, 40, 50, 50 people are bidding on one house. Obviously, only one person is going to be the winner, right? So, and that's the thing with the mortgage world right now. I mean, we're all very, very busy. We're incurring costs, with, you know, for credit reports and getting people approved and everything else. And then they'll say, hey, I'm going out tomorrow, look at a house. And you, your fingers are crossed for them. But then they come back and find out they were outbid. And then part of that too is you're seeing people who are maybe put, throwing caution to the wind and waiving inspections and, and offering more than a home price and guaranteeing the difference and everything else. So it is a little crazy, but it is important to remember too, there are a number of programs out there that require no money down or very little money down. And there's also grants, state grants. There's also programs, a lot of different towns will have um, things where they can, if you move to the town and, and buy a house and work there, you might get some extra money. It might be like forgivable money. Um, so really, when you're looking at places, you know, look what's on their website or talk to local realtors and lenders. They know all the little grants and programs out there that can help you out. Yeah, really good advice. And, and that's something that applies nationally. Now, Carl, uh, you know, we have lived through this pandemic. Maybe it's an endemic. I don't know. I guess it depends on who you ask. But the, what we do know is that the world has shifted. And there are a lot of people now who have moved. You know, we've, we talk about the great resignation on this network all the time. But there's an impact to buying a home. And there's something now called a non-qualified mortgage. What is it and how does it apply now to the gig, upon, gig economy? Yes, I mean, the non-qualified mortgage has been around for several years, but I think you're gonna start hearing that term more and more often. And basically it's just, it's a type of mortgage that doesn't fall into agency guidelines. But more importantly, it's not subprime. We all heard subprime and that, the toxic mortgages and everything else. <laughs> it's not that, it's done with um, really you know, more strict underwriting. Um, they don't throw caution to the wind. You know, back in, you know, 
2000, the joke was if you could fog a mirror, you could get a loan, right? Um, now you really do have to qualify, but we live in a weird world now. We have people who are, like you said, the great resignation, they're resigning and, and starting consulting firms and they're doing pretty well for themselves, but they don't have that two-year track history. Uh, maybe they have money coming in, maybe um, their parents moved in with them, but you can't count border income, right? But the parents are sharing some of the bills. Well, you might qualify under there. Self-employed people whose accountants are telling them, hey, let's find a way to make sure you don't pay a lot of taxes. Also means you're not gonna show a lot of income. But if we show cash flow and other things, that's another way to cut non-qualify mortgage can work. So it's a way to meet the needs of this new gig economy. People making extra money doing consulting, side hustles, all those other things, or just maybe for whatever reason, they just don't fit those normal square peg, square hole type things. Yeah, and it seems to be more and more people, especially uh, among my age range, you know, 50 and older, uh, people left the corporate world and now doing the things maybe they like. It was like an impetus for change. Carl, relative to conventional mortgages, is there a big difference in the rates and the interest rates? I know we were talking about interest, interest rates a couple of minutes ago and they are, mortgage rates are, are going up and we've seen that, but what's the difference convent, between a conventional mortgage rate and a, uh, a, a non-qual mortgage rate? So in a non-qualified mortgage, the rates are going to be a little bit higher just because of the inherent risk. They're not going to be able to verify a lot of things and they're, they're overlooking some of the stuff. Plus, we're not selling it to the agency. So, you know, you don't have that. You're not backed by the full faith of, you know, of the credit of the government. Um, so because of that, it's a little bit higher. I would say in most cases, uh, somewhere between a half to maybe even a full point higher than normal conventional rates. But the fact remains, if it's a way for you to get into a property and it's what you want to do, you know, again, you've, you've decided emotionally and financially you want to buy a house. Maybe it's cheaper than paying rent. I mean, right now it's it's crazy in the rent world. I'm seeing landlords ask for a three month security deposit, minimum eighteen month terms, and crazy crazy rents. I just had someone tell ask me if I could hook them up with a realtor to find rental properties because the person that owns the ten homes that they live in, they're trying to jack the rents immensely and they're trying to get these people to move out so they can put more people in at higher rent. So, it's uh, you know good for the landlord. I mean, if that they bought it as an investment. But if you're an individual consumer, you really have to look out and see what your options are. But if rents go up to say 2,400 a month and you can get into a house for 1,800 a month, even with today's rates, something to consider. Yeah, it, it, just going back to the rental uh, question for a second, is there a limit, to, I mean, maybe this is state by state, but is there a limit to how high a landlord can rent, uh, can jack up the rate on a, uh, from year to year? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be state and sometimes even, uh, you know, local jurisdictions will have rules, but um, it's going to depend on the lease. And you know, if they say in the lease, they can raise your rent. If they say in the lease, they can kick you out. I mean, some landlords, I'm hearing stories of they're, uh, you know, finding maybe ambiguous clauses to get the person, hey, I'm not renewing you because they know that they can rent it for more. So, you know, it's it's tough. And that's the beauty. Like when you own you're your own boss, right? But then you're also going to have to pay for all the repairs. When you rent, you don't have to pay for any repairs, but you're kind of subject to some of the other things that are going on out there. So something to think about. Yeah. Well, Carl, I need to take a very quick break. When okay. we come back, we'll talk about things that you should ask your mortgage broker and mortgage lender. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. 
So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. It's not some magical number, and it's not something we just achieve at the end. It's a feeling of freedom to live our lives the way we intended, through the ups, the downs, all of it. This is financial security, and Lincoln Financial Solutions will help you get there as you plan, protect, and retire. This is Lincoln Financial. Welcome back. We're talking to Carl Delmont of Fremont Mortgage Corporation. Carl, thanks so much for staying with us this morning. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, really an interesting conversation. Uh, and, and just to pick up on the last piece, uh, moving from being a renter to home ownership, taking advantage of this these non-qual mortgages, it just seems like uh, we were kind of joking off off camera that uh, you know there there's a lot of reasons that you want to be a homeowner. It's not a a right, it's a privilege, but at the same time, there are a lot of benefits and now may be the right time to jump in if you have never owned a home before. Yeah, I mean, again, with rising rates, a lot of people are moving to the sidelines to wait it out. That means there may be some opportunities if you wanna get into the mix. Uh, the keys you wanna have is definitely you wanna have a solid pre-approval from a local trusted lender. Uh, talk to the real estate agent, ask them, you know, if you get a, find some, you know, nice ad online and you apply, before you apply, ask your, your realtor, hey, what, you know this lender, what do you think? Because a lot of lenders will charge upfront application fees and they'll tell you, oh, but when you close, we'll credit you back. What if you don't close? What if you don't qualify? You just lost four or $500, right? That's money that you can use for moving, for all kinds of other things. So the other thing you wanna look for is a lender that's not gonna charge an application fee so that you know, you're not being, imagine this, like you see a, you go up to a car lot and you see a car you like, and the dealer says, oh, that's the one you like? I'll tell you what, give me $500 and I'll let you walk up and you can sit inside the car and let me know what you think. But if you buy it, I'll credit your $500 back. The car dealers wouldn't exist. But in the mortgage world, a lot of lenders do it because it's profit. They make money whether they, they give your loan or not. So I always tell people, try to avoid application fees if you can. But um, you know, to your point, you know, the difference between a mortgage broker and a mortgage lender. So a mortgage broker is someone who's using someone else's money. What that means is they're not really a true lender. They, what they do is they have contracts with various lenders. And by definition, they, they're going to shop that and try to get you the best rates and terms. Now, conversely, a lender is someone who's using their money. They sell right to the agencies. They have underwriters on staff. They make their own decisions, whereas a broker is sending it out to another lender and relying upon their, their underwriters and their closing department. So it's it's a Best of both worlds. You know, there's great mortgage brokers out there. There's great mortgage lenders. And just like in the industry, there's probably some you want to stay away from. But, um, but questions to ask, right? So a couple of things. Um, is there an application fee? If so, I'd say run away. Um, the other thing you want to look at is pre-qualification or pre-approval. Pre-qualification means they, they, you tell them what you make and they pull your credit report. And it's based upon what you just said. Now, you might make, say, $150,000 a year. But you didn't tell them that you have $700 a month in child support and some other stuff that won't show up on a credit report. All of a sudden, now your debt ratio is a little bit messed up. Or maybe you co-signed for um, some student loans or had something else going on. Um, so pre-approval, pre however, is actually a true pre-approval is 
underwritten up to the point of what they can underwrite. So obviously they don't know the appraisal and everything else. Um, in some cases, you can even get that done on what's called a TBD to be determined. So basically we're, the underwriter is approving you based on your W-2s, your pay stubs, everything else. So as a seller, when you're looking at 40 different um, op or offers for different buyers, you can whittle it down to the top five that have a pre-approval from a lender that's local and one that's your, your real or trust. Um, the other questions that I probably ask is just how long does closing take? Um, what else? Uh, any any other expected fees? Like what fees are they going to charge? And then if some, what we're seeing now because of rising rates, we're seeing some lenders push adjustables. With an adjuster rate mortgage, you're basically telling the lender for a slightly lower rate today, I'm willing to gamble and have a higher rate down the road. So you want to take a look at that and make sure you understand what are you giving up for just a little bit right now? And then the other trick is they'll say, hey, it's it's a fixed rate and it's a 30-year mortgage, but it's not both. And by that, I mean, it might be fixed for three years, then it turns into something else. So make sure you're getting quoted on a straight 30-year fix if that's what you want. But whatever terms you're getting, 15-year, 20-year, 30-year, make sure you understand all the nuances of the loan so that you're not jumping in because it's an emotional, right? And you're like, your realtor's like, we got to get that pre-approval. We got to get going right now. So you're rushing through. And you may not ask the right questions only to find out that, wow, there's three points associated with this and it's only fixed for two years. And then you want to leave, but then- but if I leave, I lose my $500 the the um, application fee. So you know, choose your lender wisely. Our slogan I came up with years ago is don't make a 30-year mistake by choosing a wrong lender. And the whole idea was think about it. Think about your choices of lenders, realtors, um, everyone else that's involved in the process. Yeah, r really good points. I just want to follow up on that. How do I discern? How do I, how do I gather the right information? Okay, time right now, there's lack of inventory. So you feel pressured. Uh, to get, jump in there, wave contingencies, work with the real estate agent. You got to have this house. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But how do you do the research to find someone like yourself and Friedmont Mortgage Corporation or the mortgage broker? Uh, because they can serve, both entities can serve an important role and, and work with a, a party. So how do I do the research? If, I, if, if someone's out there looking, how do I find, figure out if I want to partner with someone, a mortgage lender like yourself or the broker? I mean, obviously, check online reviews. Ask realtors who they like, who they rep, you know, who they recommend. In fact, a good question: Ask a realtor if you were going to buy a house or refinance a house. What lender would you go through? And that's a pretty good indication right there, right? Because if they're in the field, they know who the good ones and the bad ones are because they've been on both sides of the transaction as a seller agent, as a buyer's agent. Um, and, but you know, asking the right questions, everything else, and then just jumping into another topic, but related, if you know, you're ready to buy a house. The first thing you want to do is make sure you have your W-2s, your pay stubs, everything ready to go. Um, at least two months of your bank statements, everything so you can send it to your lender to get that pre-approval. Then you want to contact, once your loan gets accepted and or your offer gets accepted in the house, contact your HR department, your um, insurance company. Tell them, hey, look, I'm buying a house. I just got my offer approved. I got to settle in 30 days. When my lender calls you, and by the way, this is my lender's name. Here's who I'm working with. So that there's a lot of fraud out there. Um, I need you to get the verification deployment right, right away. I needed the lost pay change on the homeowner's insurance. You want to get those people on standby so they're not, because they don't really care if you buy a house or not, right? But if you tell them what's going on and they expect the call, then it's going to facilitate the process a lot more quicker. And it's going to be a lot more, uh, just a better process for everyone all around. Carl, you brought up fraud. What type of fraudulent activity, you know, we hear about scams, crypto scams, uh, privacy scams, financial data being stolen. Just real quick, what should, what should people out there be wary of uh, they are getting phone calls, emails, uh, you know, in terms of what's going on with scams right now? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the, the biggest one's going to be wire fraud. And that's where someone either hacks in or just because you're posting on Facebook, you're about to buy a house or whatever, they pose as the title company or the lender and say, oh, we're, you're getting ready to close. Congratulations. I need you to wire the down payment and here's the wiring instructions. And some people do without thinking. So you'll see any lender nowadays, their, their SIG file will have a whole disclaimer, disclosure, disclaimer, do not send money to anyone without verifying it first. What I always tell people is, you know, when anything, whether it's your credit card or anything, you should initiate the call. Don't just respond to a link or something or text someone sends you. Look in, take out your wallet, look at the back of the, the credit card, call that number, and then you, you know who you're speaking with. Call your lender, the one you've been working with. Hey, I just got this thing asking me to wire the money. Is this correct? Um, most times, we'll, we'll never ask you to wire money. Um, bottom line is we, we'll coordinate with you how that works. Um, you know, some other scams, too, are just going to be basic ID theft. 
um, you know, you don't worry about that. But the wire fraud, that's the big one. Um, the other thing is not so much a scam, but, you know, um, financial, I guess, not so much financial fidelity, but just financial communication. We've seen instances where, you know, one partner gets excited about buying a house and they go out and put a down payment on furniture and open a credit card. Or they think, oh, wow, this is cheaper than renting. I'm going to go buy a new car. Or, oh, good, I'm approved. Now I'm going to take that job offer. And they, they switch jobs midstream. You know, what I tell people is for that 30 days, from the time that offer is made to the time you settle, don't do anything without talking to your lender because you'd be surprised. Even charging something your credit card could ultimately change a number of things. So be really, really careful out there about those things. But open communication with your realtor and your lender, that's paramount. Yeah, not that it's the same, but I remember that scene in Goodfellas where De Niro's character said, what did I tell you? Don't spend money on anything after they took down the, they did the Lufthansa heist. Very different, but I think that the-, the yeah, No uh, pink Cadillacs. <laughs> yeah, no pink Cadillacs for anyone. Carl Delmont, always a pleasure chatting with you. Really great information. We look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. That wraps up this episode of BRNAM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to. Well, hey, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest in lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more in all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to see our latest content or search our archives? Well, check out our website and our streaming partners like Amazon, Roku, Samsung, and over 100 more. We're back again tomorrow. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Are you being audited and do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.